I know Thomas Edison, you know, did some work. He put in some work, but maybe he was a bitch too. See? And we should know. <laughs> we should know this, okay? Welcome to Keep It, Cricket Media show about pop culture and politics and what happens when they smack into each other at an alarming speed. I'm your host, Ira Madison III, a television writer and Fallout Boy fan. I'm Louis Fertel. I'm a TV writer and Jane Fonda historian. And I'm Aida Osman. I'm a TV writer and alleged comedian. Let's get into it. Imagine the ideal professor, someone at the top of their field, maybe a MacArthur genius, maybe a Pulitzer or Peabody winner. Maybe if you're lucky, they're an alumna too. New York Times journalist and 1619 Project mastermind, Nicole Hannah-Jones, was all of these things when UNC Chapel Hill revoked their offer of a tenured professorship after its conservative board took issue that Nicole does not believe black people arrived in this country on a carnival cruise. <gasps> Gasp. A gas, yes. They must be out of their damn minds. I would like to see other professors at that school. I'd love to know what they've accomplished. And peer-reviewed papers at JSTOR do not count. I just want to know, what, what were they thinking? Yeah, I want to see the receipts. Yeah, has anybody else written, like, a, a project of that scale that, like, literally everybody I know has at least paid attention to or clicked through online? You know, how rare is that? Mm-hmm. And I want to point out that, like, this is all part of the, like, conservative drama surrounding critical race theory, you know, which is sort of like a new buzzword on Fox News, um, which is... I don't know, making making white parents think that like we're just teaching students that white people are bad, which they are. So which we are. I'm okay. But with that's it. a but that's a secondary First point. Class, yes, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. You know? Um but it's it's so interesting to me. So like because when I was um home recently, uh I was hanging out with uh, a best friend from high school who is a teacher, you know? Uh mm -hmm. and he was like yeah, I'm literally about to go into a meeting with, like, um, a bunch of parents who are mad about their high school students learning, like, critical race theory. And uh, I have to follow up with him because the question was basically, like, he wants to ask them, please explain to me what about critical race theory actually upsets you. And I don't think that any of the people who are mad about it, who are being fed this thing on Fox News right now actually know what the fuck it is mm -hmm. or how it's different from what they were learning before you know so it's like all they know is it that it says you know like black people good white people bad tree pretty <laughs> <laughs> you said something true about trees um yeah. <laughs> they do yeah. be pretty the yeah the basis for Sequoia. a lot of this rancor is the fact that this woman nicole hannah jones is basically centering the country's history around the consequences of slavery and basically saying it's uh, the U.S.'s sort of um, main foundational moment, uh, which who would deny that? Do you not think that's like a very specific and um, telling part of our country's history? It's like people want to believe that because there were some good white people at some time who did some good things that this other thing can't be true. It's like people are super worried that the goodness of white people is being erased in some way, which is stop clinging to the goodness, damn it. Stop it. <laughs> Listen, I mean, I know Thomas Edison, you know, did some work. He put in some work, but maybe he was a bitch too. See? And we should know. <laughs> we should know this, okay? Uh, I think part of the problem too is like, and we can speak to this as uh, – you know, people who've gone through the American school system, right? There is such a, you must get such whiplash. It must be harder now to be a teacher because I remember us, right? Like we're in grade school and we're being told stories about happy pilgrims. But when you're mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. school and you're making like um, projects around Thanksgiving about pilgrims and Native Americans and like happy Thanksgiving, like how then all of a sudden like, Later, do you tell students, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, like, that was, like, a genocide. But we, we wanted you to be happy about Thanksgiving when you were a kid. Now you're an adult. Uh, yeah, them pilgrims just, like, straight up killed some people. 
<laughs> it's like, welcome to 11th grade A push. Trail of Tears happened. Figure it out, young child. And I remember being <laughs> so jarred and disgusted with the world around me. And like, why is there an expansion pack to American history right now? Can you guys have just told me the, the shit at the beginning? Uh, very frustrating. Again, yeah, very whiplashy. I, I also remember us not speaking ever, ever about slavery until I was in late high school. Mm-hmm. Oh, it okay. certainly don't alert you to the fact that many of the American heroes and people you are studying in history class own slaves. I, I will mm-hmm. never forget, uh, this kind of went viral a couple years ago, but you know the game show, sorry, Double Dare from the 80s with Mark Summers on Nickelodeon? No. They actually, oh, you know I know Double <laughs> Dare. Actually, I do, I do. I do, I do know Double Dare. <laughs> Come on. They Family had a, Double <laughs> Dare. I'm just making sure. Um, they asked a question that was, what, what U.S. president who wrote the Declaration of Independence also owned blank number of slaves like named the number and i was like whoa so stop uh, pretending that like there hasn't <laughs> been like mainstream knowledge about this sort of thing for years and years and i also want to add um uh one of the my favorite comedies in the 90s adam's family values has a mm. scene where they perform a thanksgiving pageant at their summer camp and <sighs> it's it, it's supposed iconic to be just like film. No, yes iconic film super funny but it weirdly is a subversive and great scene because Wednesday has to play Pocahontas at Thanksgiving, who, of course, was not there. And so it's, it's sort of making fun of how stupid people are about historical events. And then mm-hmm. she, she goes rogue and, like, sets the whole place on fire, and it becomes this revenge fantasy on behalf of the Native Americans. But, like, there is actual, like, uh, 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 anger there about how people perceive these kinds of historical events and how stupid they are to accept them as they're presented to them. Mm -hmm. I feel like we definitely had a lot of media that we consumed in our age, uh, in our younger ages, that was trying to do that, right? Uh, And now because of the proliferation of social media uh, and projects like this, you know, um, we're, we're having more open and honest conversations about them. And the problem is that before, you know, like people like to have them just swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. I feel a huge frustration now knowing that, I mean, conservative people, the the right side is always the most vocal, like they're the zealots about cancel culture. But when it comes down to it, the people who actually experience the real ramifications of cancel culture are the people who are going to lose job opportunities and and lose access to financial resources because of the conversations that are being had. Of course, nobody's talking about cancel culture on the conservative side when it comes to this situation. But the inability to get tenured at a job where you're supposed to be there is Mm -hmm. is directly is directly getting canceled yeah that's the only time this is actually happening and the 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 whole problem too with like like cancel culture again is uh it is a thing but we've also gotten to such an inane place where we've gotten to this and also emily wilder being fired by ap for voicing support Mm -hmm. for palestinians that is compared to uh, a comedian losing a job for saying like a racist joke, right? Like mm-hmm. all of it swirls into the same thing. And it's like, you can't even discuss what cancel culture is and people who are actually being canceled and losing jobs um, when everyone wants to make it all like seem so, so stupid, you know? It's yeah. like, it's off the heels of like Joe Rogan complaining about like white men being silenced. And it's like, Bitch, more people listen to you than us. Mm-hmm. And we're not silent or silenced. And now you're going to get to go on like a triggered tour and make millions off of the fact that you, are where you were quote unquote silenced in any way. Yeah. The only trigger tour I want to see is Trigger Trey. Okay. <laughs> that's, no, that's untrue. Bottoms that's up. That's untrue. Bottoms up. I would never go see a Trey Songz concert. I do, I, I do love the songs. As always, I feel like those two words are just a deflection, a, a way to deflect talking about what somebody has actually done and actually mm-hmm. investigating whether or not someone should be facing harsh or lenient consequences. Like, again, the idea that Harvey Weinstein and this woman might be under the same umbrella because they have been both canceled in some way is so insulting, is so minimizing of the very hard discussions we're trying to have. It's so self-aggrandizing, too. Oh, totally. It's that's so what, egotistical, that's what, usually. That's, yeah. that's what Ellen did, right? Like, she went straight to cancel culture. Yeah, it's yeah. like you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be ready to invoke this as if it's something that's eating up, you know, 
the best yeah. of society or something. And it's like, real tea, your show's getting canceled, Ellen, because nobody wants to go on it anymore. It's not a challenge for her. Times. Yes. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's also bringing in um, the the notion of what tenure is at, like, a college, you know. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that much about tenure. <laughs> <laughs> this is the authority people come to this podcast for. I know. Okay, yo, listen, I don't know that much. I know, I know sexy teen dramas. I know the inner workings of high schools, thanks to Boston Public. But where's the sexy <laughs> academic drama? There is so little college cinema, and so, and so little I'm not college. Watching Grownish. Right, 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 right. I can't. <laughs> also, are there not like seventy sequels to that, or seventy spinoffs to that show at this point? My God, we can't do ish yeah. that many times. Um, I mean, there's they're already airing Faggish on Logo. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at least they got to Logo. <laughs> yeah. And me and Rami are working on Halalish right now, so it's really just <laughs> a devastating, <laughs> devastating world we live in. Um, yeah, there is a dearth of undeclared on college campuses yeah, yeah. undeclared <laughs> undeclared yeah. was great mm-hmm. enjoyed it but canceled too soon you know and like a sort of like once just teen like dramas go to college <laughs> <Just like our girl>. <laughs> <laughs> once teen shows go to college right like that's usually a sign for um the writers don't give a fuck about telling stories mm-hmm. that sort of like resonate uh or like are realistic anymore like once anybody goes to college on a show uh, except for Gilmore Girls, maybe. Um, once anybody goes to a Ooh, yeah, yeah. college, they are just sort of adults. Right. <laughs> and you sort of see them walking around campus talking to each other, but they, they, it's never like stories um, you know, about college. Greek, actually, I would suggest Greek was a very good show. It's almost like I, it's the it's a plot point always where like the kid gets the letters and then it's like a DJ Tanner and then she goes off and we don't hear from her again. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's been the argument that it's because college is a less relatable experience than high school for most Americans. Mm. No, that yeah. makes sense. But it's just weird that when I think of definitive depictions of colleges in movies or whatever, okay, Animal House does come to mind. But after mm. that, when I'm thinking about the reality of campus life, the next example that comes to mind is Scream 2. That does mm. kind of convey the feel of yes. a large campus and running Four from building okay. to building. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, the I know house what you bunny. Did last summer. <laughs> yes. Get that acceptance mm-hmm. letter. Yeah, to Barnard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to wrap uh. this up, but I can't believe we <laughs> had a whole discussion about colleges. Um, sort I of. I didn't mention that I went to Tish. I well, here we are. Uh, here we are. I'm back, and it's keep it again. <laughs> <laughs> We're just trying to get people the hits, okay? <laughs> Nothing but the hits. You know what they come for. On Friday, Disney star and soon-to-be household name Olivia Rodrigo released her debut album, Sour, to universally sweet praise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we were not ready. We're not ready. Uh, what did we think of the album? This is a massive debut and and not just because Mm. of the quality of it this is it's truly been a minute since a new pop star debuted with this much fanfare immediately right out the gate like from their debut single yeah it's it's the only debut album where two singles have debuted at number one so in Mm -hmm. an in an era where it feels like the last album I bought was still The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill. It's shocking that there can be fanfare <laughs> about an album. Um, mm, I have but, been listening to To Zion lately. Oh, really? I do love that song. It's really good. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Carlos, <laughs> Carlos Santana's on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we can talk about that another time. Uh, here's the thing. I do like the album. Even though it go. has five here things, go, I don't, five specific things I don't like, and here are <laughs> here they are. Oh God! Here we go. <laughs> the, not a list, bitch. Not a, a list. list. <laughs> and not here an we go with the five things Louis Vertel hates to hear <laughs> on an album. <laughs> David David Letterman top ten fanfare number one. <laughs> The sleepy, moody, lethargic girl vocals that have taken over the music industry for the past six years. And by that, like, I call it Zanny Lennox, where we're just sitting here listening and you sound waterlogged. And it's just not a pure vocal. Like, you're trying, you're like establishing a character instead of just singing, and it bothers me. Okay. Second thing, there are like five of the same song where it's like, somebody's so pretty and I'm so sad. Okay, great. 
Uh, is there another thing I don't like? The lyrics are okay. It feels a little bit like a grown up, like a grown up writing YA about how they think a teenager thinks. And I know she just wrote it with one other person, but it felt a little bit like Riverdale to me. Some of the angst of the album, but otherwise the up tempo stuff, like brutal, the first track, fabulous, mm. and reminds me of my favorite two thousands band, the Veronicas. Boy, was that even a five things? <laughs> it was girl. Four. I didn't know how many things, things there were. I didn't know how many things there were. Okay, girl, if you kind of keep it with a list, you better have a uh, list. You better complete the list. You better the complete the better fucking be list. Back to the first no, thing. give us two more Lewis. things you don't like on albums, Lewis. <laughs> right now, I I will get to it as they will roll out as the conversation <laughs> happens organically. Um, gradually, grad. These are the hit singles. The album rollout is coming. Okay, cool. Yes, um, I feel like. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me about the Veronicas. Yes, girl. Untouched. Um, Leave Me Alone, my favorite Veronica song. Oh, That's mine is When It All Falls Apart. That's the one I was trying to think of right now. That's kind of a deeper cut, honestly. But that song is, ooh, I'm going back. That reminds me, though, the Veronicas. This I'm so happy Olivia Rodrigo has decided to go the pop punk rock mm-hmm. girly direction because we have this happening at the same time as Transparent Soul dropping with Willow Smith. So that already yes, felt like it had yes, fire. Yes, listen. We, we will point yes. out that that song is it, okay? It's the one. It is the one. It is the one. And also, it's giving me, we haven't had a rock girl. I, I grew up on Avril Lavigne. Mm-hmm. Let It Go was an album. I just held it so dearly to my heart. And I think also of like Taylor Momsen, who we know is mm-hmm. Jenny Humphrey on Gossip Girl, but was also in The Pretty Reckless and gave us mm-hmm. so much moody, eyeliner filled, grunge filled. The Donnas. Just, you know, the Donnas, sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. We're back. It's giving me that. Back, it was girls. giving me that debut album, to be honest. Uh, a little less rocky. Um, I will say also that um, Transparent Soul, one aside, uh, my niece, when I was home for Mother's Day, was like, she's 14. She was like, I, I like, I'm really into this song. I was not what I usually listen to, but, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh my God, this is just like when I went through my rock phase at 14. I was nice to see it happening again. But uh, I think the album is great. And mm-hmm. I will address Lewis's points. One by one. <laughs> First. I won't. I'm going to leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about this when we talked about the new Billy song, Your Power. I like that the girls are giving you, like, you know, the, the, like, the moody music. They're giving you operatic. They're giving you, you know, like, singing about their feelings. It feels, you know, like, like I, I compared it to Feist before. It's sort of what Taylor has moved into doing. Um, without trying to chase pop trends. And it seems that they're just sort of like, she just got her guitar, and I would rather this than like the white boys I went to high school with like pulling out their guitar and singing Yesterday again. <laughs> True. Now, I feel like it's not that I am against mood-setting music, but I feel like they're mm-hmm. all going for the same mood. Like, mm. I don't feel like it's a verse, that, like like the Billy to... Olivia Mm -hmm. to even like people like Ellie Goulding years ago it like it Mm -hmm. feels still very of a like like we're stuck in this like really viscous um emotional puddle place and uh which is uh, and another thing I just thought of another thing that bothers me are you ready um here we go the Washington number four the Washington Post (laughs) uh in their headline said compared it to Jagged Little Pill and I feel like people are often very facile about that where I feel like when Alanis Morissette came out, and she comes up a lot because she has a, a you know a, a debut that was that startling, but something specific about her that caught on was how weird and idiosyncratic she was. Like she mm-hmm. as a personality was like, she's my best friend and yet somebody I've never quite met before. Whereas Olivia Rodrigo to me feels like a high school character on a TV show in a good way, full of emotions, mm-hmm. but I've seen it before also. Mm-hmm. I will say that I think that she initially brought up those comparisons because she was vibing with that album. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. But well, it makes sense because she came through the Disney machine, yes? Totally. You know, like, and she came through the Disney machine and was in it for a minute before she popped off like this. Um, so it's similar to, you know, Miley or um, it's similar to, Even you know, Selena like Selena and Demi, Gomez. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. The only it's difference the pop-punk is... Pipeline, like- yeah, the only difference is I think, and I think John Caramonica mentioned this in the New York Times review of it. Um, this is so different from those girls because 
Olivia has a direct line to her fans that the Disney girls had never had before, right? It was all fun. There was, they were all funneled into the system. And Olivia has um, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram. Like, none of the other Disney girls had that. So she's able to take some, some slight more control of her image um, than someone would before. You, maybe a bit compared to uh, Miley, because as we stated, you know, like, her dad was the executive producer of her show. You know, she didn't mm-hmm. really get, like, caught up in the sauce. You know, mm-hmm. she's not now attacking UFOs and frozen yogurt shops. So... Um, <laughs> I do want to point out, though, that uh, I like the pop your punk stuff. Brutal is a fucking amazing song. Mm-hmm. A lot of fun. Amazing. And I think Also, that, brutal, great word. And I probably yeah. say it all the time on this podcast. I overuse certain things. A, um, <laughs> a, a flashy sort of pop punk song that I think is that and good for you, I think are real hints of like what I want to see from her going forward because it's it's like it's expressing her anger too as like a young woman in a really interesting way and i think it is i mean no matter what age you are like men ain't shit right um but also so many of the emotions like feel also queer coded uh and not just because um a lot of these songs may be about a a queer man Mm -hmm. if they're still Mm -hmm. about joshua bassett who sort of came out (laughs) I don't know. That was enigmatic. You know what? In 2021, you can just come out with um, putting um, colored hearts on Instagram. So that's cool. <laughs> he, she also has that song "Hope You're Okay" at the end, which is like clearly about like yeah. a, you know, like a gay teen who is like cutting themselves uh, and that she hopes mm-hmm. is okay. So I was happy to hear that song because, again, the content meta of the album is pretty uniform. Like it, mm-hmm. she's kind of. It's coming from the same perspective all the time, and like, which is fine. But she didn't really find super versatile ways to explain. It. Like, I kind of did feel like I heard the same song three or four times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, but I, I want I want to reiterate that I do think the album is no lower than a B minus, though. I think it's really mm-hmm. I think it's good. It's produced really well. I think that as far as she made a choice and she gave us a breakup album. Like every mm-hmm. song is consistently like I kind of missed that where most most of the time people are trying to give you like a collage of different events and stories. Mm-hmm. And this again, now that you bring up a, the queer coded album, I think of Tyler, the creator's Igor, where he takes on this whole character, this someone who's felt spurned because the man that he loves is with a woman. So it was reminding mm-hmm. me of of that, like giving me like a long narrative of how they experience this mm-hmm. breakup and the pain they went through. Also, Olivia's 18. So she benefits from being able to just say what she's feeling without us having to like go through all this flowery language like some of the most powerful lyrics to me is when she's like how can you be in love with somebody else we just broke up we just broke up were you cheating on me and it's that essence that and anybody can relate to it any age like why am i 23 crying to this child's album why it really yeah. is a remarkable achievement for how fucking young she is i mean like in the age of billy eilish maybe we've forgotten that it's totally rare we would get like a raw album from someone this young but it is Mm -hmm. super rare and it's uh accomplished and i do want to point out that i think the lyrics are bomb you know and i like like um i'm so sick of 17 where's my fucking teenage dream like that is a turn of phrase uh and it's Uh. great to know that she is a writer and i would actually compare yeah i love the igor comparison aida because i would actually compare it to uh obviously she's a person who's influenced by taylor right uh and i think that you know, Taylor initially got, you know, a lot of the flack for, you know, like making songs about exes, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the songs were a little similar, you know, but also she was a teenage girl writing these. Uh, and Olivia seems more willing to acknowledge that, though, you know, I will say the one thing about Taylor that like is, is all that you always bump up against is like whenever she's like refers to like referencing her own old songs that were about men right as like sexist or whatever right and it's like okay but girl you were doing that and you were were pushing it in the media and that was how you were getting famous and there is a way to say okay that like you want my old shit buy my old album you know and acknowledge that that's what you used to do but now you're an adult and you don't need to do that shit anymore because you're making it on your own merits but there is just sort of a weird way that taylor's sort of like tries to pretend that that didn't happen. Like, you can't men and black us, mm-hmm. girl. I want to also <laughs> say that compared to Taylor Swift, I think she does something I, I prefer, which is 
her, the the heartbreak in her songs is not ambiguous. As Aida said, not only is she straightforward about it, but like I can tell what the situation is. Whereas with Taylor Swift, I feel like she's always like swirling around what really happened, and you're just supposed to be swept up in the dramatics of it without really knowing what went on. And I always feel like mm-hmm. she it's like she's pretending she's getting into the specifics of heartbreak, but in fact, just kind of baiting you with the idea of it. Whereas this is like, I hate you for this reason right now, which is refreshing. Mm-hmm. You know, she, I mean, it's like, she, it's like she's got some teen therapy. She knows why she's mad. I really love the song Jealousy, Jealousy with the line, yes. um, comparison is killing me f- slowly. I think I think too much about kids who don't know me because like the other half of the album too is about like, the image that she thinks that like, like that line I mentioned in Brutal, right? It's a lot of the album too is about what she thinks that she should be presenting herself as to the public, but also like what a teenager should be, you know? Uh, Mm -hmm. I think she's got a really cool handle on that. I like a lot of the lyrics and I think that like, she's really going to grow into a fantastic artist. I mean, it's just fun to listen to. Yeah. Truly, just for a moment, want to acknowledge the level of control this young girl has over her voice, the way mm-hmm. she like can riff quietly. I mean, I heard so many Lord influences, Billie Eilish influences in this project. It was almost undeniable. Taylor Swift mm-hmm. on Good For You, like giving us that melancholy, acoustic, clear vocals. Mm-hmm. And I also really, really appreciate the lyric, who am I if not exploited? that she says in Brutal. I just like remember mm-hmm. feeling a pang of like, wow, it's not often we get to, to hear a young woman in Hollywood or in the music industry immediately at such a young age be aware of their, of their role and how people view them as a business, especially someone who is such a wildfire of a pop culture phenomenon well, as Olivia Rodrigo. Well, you know, she's in the Disney game, baby, you know? Um, if, you say, if you say the wrong <laughs> thing about Palestine, they will call you Mark Ruffalo and say, send out a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, re- I'm really glad you know she's here and to bring up the Igor thing again you know um, I think that she has a handle on sort of like really personalizing um, these songs but also making them universal in an interesting way where I don't know if she'll have to go that Igor route or like she could definitely because she seems like a great storyteller but I don't know if she has to go that route yet like sort of the way how like I think that Taylor Swift really came into her own as an artist with um Folklore and Evermore right because a lot of her albums were you know what we talked about in the past and then it was sort of chasing some pop trends with like reputation and things which is still my fave but um Mm -hmm. obviously she talked about how Folklore and Evermore was so freeing because she was wasn't writing personal stories anymore like she was just storytelling you know and giving you Sufjan you know but I don't think Olivia needs that um third person i think she's like she's she's giving you first person narrative on this album i also think her Mm -hmm. snl performance was better than expected it's it's always weird when somebody who has like such a full studio sound actually recreates it in a live performance like wow you your voice really does sound like that it's (laughs) Mm -hmm. come through come through olivia yes we're really impressed 